Hey you guys, this is your girl Natural. Welcome back to my channel. Please do me a favor if you have not already, go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. Click the bell so you know whenever I post a video. Now, my lighting is all over the place right now. I'm sorry, I kept trying to fix it, but it keeps just going in and out and it's doing its own thing, so I tried. So today, I really wanna talk about microaggressions. I've got some great content to go through with you guys. Um, yeah, let's talk about this. So basically, I wanna go ahead and caveat this with saying that um, if you are watching this video, there's basically two sets of people I'm talking to. I'm talking to the people who have experienced microaggressions themselves, and it's soothing to have these conversations. It is healing to have these conversations because A, you feel validated, like, hey, it's not just me, somebody else has experienced that. But B, it's also because, like, you know, I just, it, if, if, it, if we don't talk about it, if we don't do something about it, that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, nothing's going to get done. So um, that's sort of the first set of people I'm talking to. The second set of people would be the aggressors, the microaggressors themselves. Now, um, you may in fact come on my channel and you may think, hey, I'm not a microaggressor. I'm not a racist person. Um, you know, like, I'm just misunderstood. If people have thought that I was being a micro, I was do, I was serving microaggressions in the past, then they might have been mistaken. And I, I keep coming forward because I'm basically trying to catch the light so that it's okay. Um, you know what? It really takes a certain level of humility and um, wanting to learn other people's perspectives, wanting to understand other people's perspectives to really get the full picture. So, um... You know, if you are a microaggressor, if someone in the past has told you that you're racist, you're being a Karen or a Ken, um, that you come across as insensitive, and you were automatically on the defensive, and you are on the defensive, and you refuse to listen, you know what? Everybody moves in their own time. So if that's who you are, if you're closed off, and you don't want to accept or hear other perspectives, there's really no reason for you to continue on with this video. So you can just go ahead and click, you know, dislike if you want to, leave your nasty comment below and, and move on about your business. And, and I won't be really affected and you won't really be affected. But ultimately, there will be a, a residue there. You know, there'll be a residue for both of us. And it's, it's, it's sad. And you're called society, you know, history is calling you to do something about that. And you have the choice of whether to do something about it. But I firmly believe that, you know, people of color, people of the LGBT community, um, people who are of non-Christian religion, marginalized people, the people who often receive microaggressions, I think it's up to us also to be open enough to share when we've been hurt so that people really understand it, open enough to educate people on, on how to go about doing these things better the next time, but also um, open enough to let things go. Because some people really, really will not be receptive to you explaining why them staring at you nonstop is offensive to you and why it hurts you. There will be some people who, when they say, um, for instance, if you're a black person and you're on vacation with your kids and you're a man, and someone says, you know, a, a white person says to you, oh, wow, it makes me feel so good to see you here with your kids, you know, and they say it like that, you here with your kids, you know. It's up to you to sort of, also not come from a place of sort of this militant you know wanting to beat the 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 sensibility into someone you know you also kind of have to come from that place of being able to um take a step back and be calm be reserved and and fill out the waters to see if that person is even receptive to um discuss discussing this from a human a, a human place and, and really being open to learning, you know, that's really all that it comes down to. Some people are so set in their ways that the idea of someone educating them 
um, really, really just that doesn't sit well with them. Um, yeah, but you know, even the, the, the 80 year old person can still have things to, to learn in life. You know, the person who closes themselves off to information, to understanding people better, that is the person who is going to live a very, very sad, angry life. You know, I, I, that, that to me is a person, a person who shuts themselves off from understanding other perspectives, from learning something new, even if it's from someone younger than you, poorer than you, whatever it is. Anyone who shuts themselves off from that, I see as someone who's going to live a very, very sad, angry life. So with that being said, um, basically we've got two people, two sets of people that we're talking to. Um, people who read this resonates with them because they've experienced themselves, other marginalized people. And it's not just, you know, people of color who can experience microaggressions. It's women, you know, there are the slights that men do, those misogynistic slights where men feel like they can just put their hand on your back, you know, or... Um, Hey, say, hey, sweetheart, uh, do me a favor and go grab me a coffee, you know? <laughs> you know, like, um, it, there's, you know, Islam, there's rampant Islamophobia that goes on in the world. You know, me as someone who's Catholic, I actually grew up as Muslim, and I'm so thankful that I did, but there is this nastiness out in the world, you know, even from people who might have very good intentions, you know, where they assume because I'm black and I'm American and I was raised Muslim that I didn't just have a normal childhood when in all reality, I went to a private school um, up until I was, uh, let's see here, up until I was probably about let's see, fourth grade, so about nine or ten, I would say, I was in a private Muslim school just like someone would go to a private Catholic school, a very good private school. Um, you know, my parents sat down and read the Quran with me. You know, I lived in a very loving and warm home. You know, it's just that that thing of people feel like, oh, you're raised Muslim, like you must have been raised like some sort of barbarian or something. And it's like, no, <laughs> it was pretty normal. Those microaggressions, you know, microaggressions against um, uh, uh, even Asian people, you know, the, the slurs that you could call someone, and I won't even name what those slurs are, but slurs that people hurl against Pakistani people or Indian people or Chinese people. Um, this is all just to say that, you know, it's not just black people who can experience microaggressions. Basically coming out of a world where white privilege has been just the norm for the past 20 centuries, um, that changing in the past century, there's going to be some difficulty with that. There's going to be some change with that. But you know what? We could say even 10 centuries ago, there were black queens, there were African queens, there were Asian monarchies and, you know, imperial courts that already existed before white privilege just became this dominated thing. But you know, that's the problem like almost with critical race theory, you know, the fact that people don't want to talk about our histories in a real way. Now, I do feel like I said, the US is a little bit further than the UK if we're speaking about English speaking countries. I don't know much about Australia. So if, if there are any Australia's on Australians or uh, Irish people or Scottish people, you also feel free to put in the comments what you think um, has been the progress about discussing race within your history. Um, but this is where a lot of this microaggression stuff comes from. It comes from the background of race. And then, you know, secondarily, in this day and age, then secondarily, you know, religion comes into it and then gender comes into it. And then, um, you know, um, sexual orientation comes into it. But most of the times when you hear people talking about microaggression, it's usually talking about race. And so that's pretty much the... the um, the, traje the trajectory we're going to talk about kind of today. I have a few references we're going to talk about. Um, and then we're basically going to let it go. <laughs> we're going to let it go. We're going to talk all about microaggressions and then we're going to let it go. How are we going to let it go? 
I'm gonna go through some amazing quotes to you about uh, maintaining your mission, maintaining your your peace, your tranquility, um, keeping your objectives even in the face of criticism. Because that's basically, at the end of the day, what microaggressions are. They're just this criticism. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Harry and Meghan and, and, and um, how they experience microaggressions as well as Idris Elba. Right after this, I'm going to film a video about uh, Idris Elba. But, you know, one of the things that I keep seeing over and over again, one of the things that I keep seeing over and over again in threads talking about the racism, the systemic racism that Harry and Meghan received while they were uh, a part of the royal family across Twitter, across YouTube, across Reddit, um, all across the internet are people who were saying, but when did they experience racism? But when did they experience racism? The UK isn't a racist country. When did they experience racism? And I feel like these people, they've really closed off their ears and they've closed off their hearts and they've closed off their eyes because they aren't considering microaggressions. Now, in this video we're going to watch in a second, um, a young person, which, uh, I mean, uh, this is something really close to my heart. Child advocacy, I feel like, has always been close to my heart, but it's only been in the past few years where I've actually been able to put a name to it. And so it's a cause that I'm going to continue to advocate for. Um, but this young person, she's interviewing um, a psychologist who comes out of the Columbia University Department. And um, they're basically discussing the psychology behind microaggressions. And this young woman is like, I'm like, ah, I love it because she's she is just asking all the right questions. She's so inquisitive and beautiful. She's got a beautiful mind. And so um, we're going to watch that and react to it in just a second. But um, I feel like what those British people are kind of closing their ears, their hearts, their minds off to are the subtle, not overt uh ways that racism can manifest itself not just calling someone an n-word or someone physically assaulting someone just because they are hispanic or black or asian or islamic you know or arabic oh, sorry sorry um that's not the only way that this manifests it manifests itself in slights okay for example i gave you guys that example when i was on the train you know just sitting down next to this older white woman she gave off the sort of body language, the very, very clear, intentional, or I don't know where I stopped off. So, um, basically, you guys know that I'm a contractor. So that means I work in marketing and I saw very from the very beginning that the corporate world is sort of interweaved with lots of Karens, you know, lots of, you know, Karens and Kens and passive aggressive you know, racism and microaggressions and tokenism and stuff. Um, and I saw very early on from my experience, my raw creativity, just being a creative pe to person, period, and my educational background. It was like, whoa, I can take contracts and work as my own business, basically as an entrepreneur providing this service to people and be the boss <laughs> instead of having to constantly deal with all these power struggles uh, just because I'm a black woman. And so um, that's when I started freelancing and I started contracting and I have a contract now. I've been doing it for about six, six months, something like that. And, you know, when it comes to what I do now, as far as marketing, like, you know, I, it's not like a big agency where there's proofreaders, there's writers, there's designers. You know, sometimes I do encounter clients like that who already have their own in-house team like that. And they sort of need need to come in on oversight or to create some big ideas, some big fresh ideas or strategy or things like that. But usually the companies that I work with don't have that type of capacity. So I come in basically to work on very many facets of marketing, planning, strategy, conception, execution, basically following the campaign or project from conception to execution. And I love doing that because I love bringing the power back to the little guy. I mean, it's basic, I'm basically doing what I've done for big brands like, you know, PlayStation and Google and YouTube for small brands who basically wouldn't otherwise be able to do that. Um, 
but it's really really annoying when you know that you're bringing something to someone that is highly valuable but they're not really valuing what you're doing and they don't really understand it they don't really understand like what you're doing they don't understand uh, the work that goes into it, the education that goes into it, the experience that goes into it. And so they just undermine it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's kind of a funny thing, but you know, for example, I'm working a contract and, uh, in the past, the liaison on who I would talk to, um, she, I guess got phased off of the project because it seems like a Karen basically strong armed in and said, well, hey, I'm in marketing and sales, so I should be overseeing the marketing chick who's contracting with us. And, you know, that's fine. I, I don't even know if that's the, the, the conversation that went down because differently from the liaison who I was, you know, in, who, who I coordinated with in the past, she never ever said, hey, let's schedule a Zoom call to introduce one another to talk about projects never got that there was just one day I got an email from someone else in the organization she's like uh hey from now on include me on your emails can you do this can you do that can you do this can you do that um hey I tried to call you this 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 and then we talked on the phone once it just seemed very awkward and abrupt obviously because this woman never ever took any sort of uh, moment to get to know me, to understand what it is that I've been doing, um, to take an investment in me as someone who is a contractor with her company. And um, just from the very beginning had Karen vibes, you know. So, and, and it's even worse when it's through email, you know, when microaggressions are through email. It, and um, yeah, so basically that's all to say some people do have unconscious bias. Now, when, when Prince Harry said that thing about unconscious bias, he got a lot of flack. But I understand exactly what he was saying. I do. And I think a lot of us do. Um, some people, it's, it's really not intentional for them. You know, they, they just are being themselves. And they, the way that their delivery is, is a little clunky. But for some people, they are highly, highly, highly aware of what they're doing. They're highly aware that they're staring you down and that that's rude. They're highly aware that the way that they're talking to you has an air of superiority. They're highly aware that them calling the manager and making all this fuss has nothing to do with your performance. Microaggressions, they come from people with unconscious bias, but they also come from people who... I mean, at the end of the day, they, they really are racist. They, they, they might be a subtle, kinder form of racism. Um, but at the end of the day, it is prejudice. It's racism, it's sexism, it's prejudice, whatever it might be. And, um, you know, we can't really have a realistic discussion about this without talking about the nasty parts of our history. That's why critical race theory is so important. That's why learning about slavery, learning about um, globalization in, in terms of history is so important because otherwise you got a bunch of kids going into the world with blinders and you have what's happening right now. You have like so many forms of isolation, depression. I mean, people are isolated, depression, and they don't understand why. Well, if you just close yourself into a hole and you're angry all the time and you don't set yourself around any other perspective of, other than yourself, what do you expect to happen? That is a very, very miserable path to lead down. Um, and so historically, I think African Americans, again, this microaggressions can be applied to any marginalized group, but I'm speaking from my experience as a black woman, you know, Black people, especially one of these articles I'm going to read you in a second, Southern black people have held very long in mind that no one is going to be happy for us, no one is going to be resilient for us, no one is going to be strong for us. We have to do it ourselves. And so I think that's why, despite the generational trauma that you witness within the African American community, you still see us generally as people who are creative. We love to channel our ideas channel our pain into creation. We are people who are resilient. We are people who are very family and community tribally oriented because, as I said, we have known very long that we've been marginalized, oppressed for 
so long, so, so, so long that nobody else would do it for us. And so, um, yeah, to these isolated groups, these groups that are just stemming up around hate, around anger, um, oftentimes they are riddled with um, suicide and, and mental illness and drug addiction. You know, it's like, the way they come off, you know, when you see them angry and Twitter and YouTube, you know, they will battle you down. And at some point, you might just be like, dude, I'm defeated. Like, I, I got to go eat dinner. You know, <laughs> it's like you won. And, and you walk away thinking that they won. You walk away thinking, man, should I have let that slide? How did I let that get away? You know, but think that. Think about, again, these angry polarized groups, you know, and this is out of microaggressions. This is the real deal. Um, they're isolated. They're sad. They're suffering from um, suicide, suicidal thoughts. Um, they even glorify glorify suicidal culture. Um, they're suffering from mental illness. They're suffering from drug addiction many times. And so, no. They didn't win. You didn't win and they didn't win. That's the whole point is that no one won. Um, and so, yeah, micro microaggressions is definitely, you know, overt racism, overt, overt xenophobia, um, um, overt Islamophobia. It's, <laughs> it's one way that racism can manifest itself. But in terms of, you know, what happened with Harry and Meghan in the UK, what happened with Brexit, etc. People aren't understanding that microaggressions really can often be a form of racism itself and it has dire implications. People who experience microaggressions, they experience more uh, high blood pressure, stress, you know, they create more stress hormones. And, you know, that stuff is passed down generally, generationally. Um, in a second, we're going to watch it and this, uh, this, this professor is going to explain basically everything. But, um, Yes, so basically with that being said, let's take a look at this video. After we look at the video, we're going to look at some articles and we're just going to talk about this. So let's go. This virtual festival has been organized by Youth Celebrate Diversity and the festival is proudly sponsored by Boeing. Hello, my name is Jocelyn and I'd like to welcome you to the psychology behind microaggressions. For our guests today, we're having a Columbia educated psychologist and therapist to basically educate you on the psychology behind microaggressions. Her, her work helps communities heal from the trauma of intergenerational chains. I'd like to introduce Mariel Bouquet. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hi, Jocelyn. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. It's World Mental Health Day, so it's a good time to be talking about psychology. Yes, of course. Day. Yeah. I just want to thank you for taking the time to be part of this. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. All right, so I just basically want to ask you um, what microaggressions are. Can you just tell the audience and just give examples about that? Yeah, absolutely. So microaggressions are the everyday slights that people of color experience. Um, and that's racial microaggressions, but it can be microaggressions across identities um, that actually um, relay a message of inferiority or um, a, a message about the denigration of um, the people that are marginalized. And basically what that means is that there are subtle messages that uh, usually fall under the radar and um, because they're not very explicit, that tell people that uh, they are lesser than in some way or they're messages that are um, messages that people state because of stereotypes that they hold about specific marginalized groups. First of all, can we just talk about how amazing that definition was? Pick out the word inferior 
inferior you know when you feel a, a microaggression you feel infuriated you know and the person who does it they oftentimes do it out of some sort of insecurity in themselves because they want to feel superior i feel like we shouldn't have to say this in 2023 as i've said many times just be nice to people is it really that hard and not fake nice not a superior air um, better than you nice but just be nice to people be respectful for people if you are confused about something about someone's background about their history ask ask if they're comfortable telling you about it you know like we, we really shouldn't um, be dealing with this in this day and age and if you really are that you know lost if you really are like people are telling me that I'm a Karen people are telling me that I'm racist and I don't understand I don't have a racist bone in my body you know like go on Google like j just like this girl is gonna say in a bit it takes two seconds to go on Google go on Google yeah and um that's exactly how I feel about microaggressions because I feel like in today's society they are very much normalized and it's kind of like slight shade. Like when people will hear a lot is like, oh, like you're pretty for a black girl or I know women do get them a lot, especially in such a professional setting um, because, you know, in today's society, it pretty much is dominated by a white man's world. So do you have any advice of, you know, how to handle microaggressions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there are many microaggressions and it's important to understand that the the very thing that um, is important to note whenever microaggression has happened is the fact that it hurts. Um, it's unpleasant. It's usually led by um, erroneous beliefs about the people that um, the microaggressions is targeted towards and that in order to make a change in reference to microaggressions, they need to be called out. So the calling out of the microaggressions can be something as simple as, ouch, that really hurt. Or it can be something like, well, that was a microaggression and that was something that is basically not a part of my truth and you know i hope that you can understand or or seek to understand the reasons why you're wrong in saying this right mm -hmm. um, we don't want the persons that are um victimized by microaggressions to then take on an educator role of saying like okay so let me teach you why this is wrong right um it's important for the for the people that are there Okay, so we don't want the person who is the victim of a microaggression to have to take on the educator role. I think that we're often um, inclined to do that. We're tempted to do that. But I feel like acknowledgement, acknowledging that was a microaggression or, hey, that hurt me because I feel like that was a microaggression. That's basically the extent of all that you need to do. You can go home and complain to your husband, complain to your friends, your family members who will understand about it, you know, and you can get your validation there. But don't be tempted to just educate the microaggressor because they, it's just like an addict, you know. You can't force an addict to go and get help. You can support them, you can support that notion, but at the end of the day, they have to go and, and want to get it themselves. The microaggressor needs to want to be educated about this and want to change that behavior. It's not up to you to change an oppressor. Important for the for the people that are the perpetrators to go and do the work. But it is something that's harmful. It's it hurts and it's why, you know, it fits within the realm of psychology because we understand there is a lot of uh, psychological dilemmas that come up for people whenever they they're experiencing microaggressions. Yeah, so um Basically, I want to know what inspired you to get into this work. Was it basically experiences you had as a child or did you develop this idea of a career later on in your life? Yeah, it came later on. I really wish that I had um, the understanding, as you do, as many students do these days, uh, about the fact that I was experiencing microaggressions. Like I would experience them, but it didn't 
really sink in until my 20s when I learned what microaggressions were, that that's what was actually happening. And so um, the frustrating piece about that is, is that I then didn't have the opportunity to combat them and to say, no, no, that's not my, I'm not, you know, somebody that's an angry black woman or an angry black girl, right? Like you don't get to say that about me and um, you should probably like, you know, look into why it is that you believe that about black women and girls rather than, you know, internalizing, which is sometimes what happens to us when we don't have the consciousness around um, microaggressions and racism. And so, it's, um, you know, it's it's something that definitely came about whenever, um, really when I was in grad school, and I actually had the pleasure of being able to be in the microaggressions class at, um, at my school at Columbia University that's taught by Daryl Wingsu. And then I, I was a... Um, I was a teaching assistant for him and um, and in doing that work and being able to also like teach the, the work to other students, it helped to expand my knowledge about microaggressions and, and how they were actually taking root in my life. Oh yeah, of course. And um, I didn't realize I was facing microaggressions until like probably last year when yeah. one of my teachers had a lesson about it and had us write a paper. Um, and like one thing many people don't know is how like microaggressions can also be presented in actions. Like, you know, when a black man walks into an elevator and someone like clenches. Just to let you guys know, we're not gonna watch this whole thing. It's about 25 minutes long. I'm gonna stop at 10 minutes um, because I feel like you get the, you literally get the bulk of what you need just in those 10 minutes. It's so, so, so good. But um, I'm gonna put this in the link in the bio. Um, and you guys can go ahead and check it out and everything because really, really valuable stuff what they're talking. Watch the whole way through. I did. It's really, really great. Is how like microaggressions can also be presented in actions. Like, you know, when a black man walks into an elevator and someone like clenches their purse. Yeah. Or, you know, when a black family walks into a store and like the workers are following them around, um, which I have experienced before. And it just really shows you how these biases are really deep rooted into our society and basically people's subconscious because they don't really understand they're doing a microaggression is just so normalized. It is absolutely. And I'm so sorry that you've had to have those experiences as of I, you know, I think that, you know, being a person that is black in America and black in the world means that you, you're going to have experiences that are, um, based on uh, racial discrimination on an ongoing basis. And um, the thing about it, you know, you, you explained it so beautifully, is that there, it's part of unconscious biases that um, white individuals and also non-Black individuals really need to um, understand fully in order to not replicate it in ways that cause racial trauma to the individuals that are on the receiving end of the microaggression. Yes, exactly. Um, so I'm just more interested also right there, guys, right there, you know, it's just like I told you about that experience with being a senior level, you know, marketing director, you know, like the higher up I got within where I was in my field, the less I saw people who looked like me and the more I experienced microaggressions. So um, I can't remember who it was. I think we discussed um, I can't remember who it was, but at some point we discussed about how like, you know, people of color will go in so hard to show, you know, even though those glass ceilings exist, I'm going to keep moving up in that corporate space, in the athletic world, in the psychology world, in the educational field. And it's like when they finally arrived, when they finally get there, they're like, I'm not doing this crap anymore. Because by the time they've gotten there, they've experienced so much microaggression, so many um, feelings of being isolated, of being othered, of being, you know, tokened, that it's just like, it's not even worth it at that point anymore. But, you know, at that point, they've also got a certain level of education, of uh, experience that it's like they don't even need it anymore. So, um, but I do think that the workplace, the corporate space, the educational space, these conversations about race and microaggressions need to happen. So you guys saw that. Now I want to read a couple of articles, just analyze a couple of articles that I came across that I thought were amazing for this. Um, because like we said, um, 
microaggressions really leave a lot of physical damage over time like more physical damage than you actually would know and um it causes higher level of stress so it could be creating more stress hormones you know often intergenerational and generationally and the black community you know those stress hormones literally get passed down from mother to baby so it's really something deeply ingrained like it will flare up that anxiety and you basically have to know how to deal with that in yourself so that you don't deal with the very real problems that are depression that are anger that are you know suicidal thoughts that are mental health issues um because it's it's up to you nobody else is going to solve those problems for you so you have to be able to take the salty words of the multitude and transform it into something positive for yourself. So I basically pulled up some things um, that I, I think are really, really, really helpful. Um, so let's look at these together. Okay, so the first thing I want to read from you is from Princeton. And it says, what Southern black women can teach us and the country about ourselves? Now, I wish they would have changed that in the and the country to and the world. OK, um, so let's just read this really quick. I'm going to kind of stop and stuff and, and talk about this, but let's read it together. So this is from Bria Baker from Refinery29, April 12, 2022. She says, it was Angela Davis who reminded us that when black women win victories, it's a boost for virtually every segment of society. It says a lot that Dr. Davis had the foresight to build a politic that benefits, benefits everyone while centering the most marginalized. Now, Angela Davis, if you don't know about her, please research her because my mom has been praising Miss Davis for a very, very long time. So I definitely know about Miss Davis. She's also from my home state, Alabama. Um, civil rights activist, you know, feminist. Um, so, yeah. Um, in my opinion, it is her southern roots that have prepared her to so easily diagnose the problems with American society while visioning something better. I've observed this same clarity and prowess in other black daughters of the South. It's Women's History Month, a time when we are celebrating and remembering the feminist contributions of women in this country. And it's black southern women who continue to teach us what true feminism is. So that begs the question, what is it they know that the rest of us don't? What can Southern black women teach this nation about the pursuit of equality, of equity? Now, I, she says equi equity a lot, and I kept thinking it was equality. So if you take a look at this and you'll have a bit of a, a theory on why she used equity instead of equality, let me know what it is. I kind of have a, an idea, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, you know, something that we do have to keep in mind also is that there is this expression called a steel magnolia. And that basically was started in the South to talk about women who were very strong. It often referred to white women, really, but it really can just be any woman and uh, who's very beautiful on the outside, but very, very strong, you know, and Southern women have that. It's deeply ingrained in us. So let's continue. To answer these and other questions, I sat down with Dr. Imani Perry, professor of American, African American Studies at Princeton University, an instant New York best time seller of South to America, a journey below to Mason Dixon to understand the soul of a nation. In her most recent book, Dr. Perry makes the case that while many consider the Deep South to be the most backward part of the 21st century America, the region has the most to teach us about ourselves and our commitments to justice. In writing this book, Dr. Perry makes it clear that she's not sugarcoating the history of the era, but rather honoring all there is to love and learn, especially from the black Americans who call it home. Um, so I really, really like this right here. She says, it is my people and traditions that move the world with song and inspire the world with freedom dreams, Dr. Perry recalls. In the South, there's a protective sensibility in terms of navigating the world and its racism. You learn and are socialized 
to have skepticism in order to be prepared. Now that right there, it's so true. You know, I feel like the reason that I'm not out here running in fem cells and in cell groups and, uh, you know, storming the Capitol and, and angry and depressed is because in the black community from a very young age, your family, your parents, your friends, your neighbors, your 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 neighbors down the street, your teachers, uh, your parents, like everybody, basically will instill this idea in you that you have to be woke, you have to be skeptical of those forces that are out there, and you have to keep your smile despite all of the injustices that are out there in the world because if you have skin that looks like this i'm sorry but it means that you have experienced injustice your whole life even in ways where you might not have noticed it before it's just like the young girl said here on the the the, the psychology behind microaggressions videos you know for a very long time she didn't even understand that she was experiencing microaggressions so anyway um that idea of being prepared, I think it's so true. When most Americans comment on the South in relation to other parts of the country, there is this idea that leaving is a relief. While this feeling is righteous considering the onslaught of disenfranchisement, especially when women, the LGBTQ community, and people of color are concerned, there's so much more to honor why many stayed. So, um... She goes on to talk about basically comparing um, um, Angela Davis and her experience on how black women not only have had to survive, but had to thrive. Um, the only thing is I can't read through everything because uh, we just don't have enough time. Given the layered forms of violence present, black women and girls in the South forged a counter-narrative and offered tools and institutions that could provide something different than what white supremacy would. The South and my Southern family offered me armor. Armor, you know. She didn't say offered me wisdom, guidance, resilience. Armor. I mean, you really have to have brick armor to deal with that hate that exists out in the world and it's so true and I'm so glad that my family prepared me for it because Lord if they didn't I'll be out here crazy um and offered me armor that I walk through the world with so um I'm gonna link this article in the bio I can't like I said we don't have time to read through the whole thing but you basically get the the idea you know um People can learn a thing or two from Southern black women. And knowing that so many Southern black women throughout generations have been nan, and not just Southern black women, black women everywhere have been nannies, have been maids, have been teachers, have been cooks. You know, when you walk up to a black woman and you feel as so familiar as to comment on her hair or to say, oh, you're so pretty for a black woman or uh, whatever it is to just stare her down. Maybe think about one of the reasons that that is, is because you maybe feel a sense of familiarity with her. Why? It's because we have been the backbone of society for a very, very long time. A thankless backbone at that. Yes, we have been cleaning your houses, cooking your food, taking care of your kids for a very, very, very long time. I think it's time that we deserve a little bit of respect. Um, anyway, off of that soapbox, let's look at some quotes because microaggressions, again, whether you're experiencing this as a woman, as an LGBTQ person, as a black person, as a person of color, uh, you know, uh, uh, Islamic person, a Muslim person, a Hindu person, whatever it might be. Um, these quotes will really, really help you because they're all basically around criticism. And that's, I really feel like that's what um, uh, microaggressions are at the end of the day. So let's start with my favorite writer, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Don't, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead, instead where there is no path and leave a trail. The next one, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. That is my, literally my status on WhatsApp. I love it so much. 
Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. To be great is to be misunderstood. Most of the shadows of this life are caused by one standing in one's own sunshine. Don't stand in your own way. A man is what he thinks about all day long. Now sit there and think about that. What do you think about all day long? Is it creativity? Is it your kids? Is it education? Is it hating people? Is it punching people? You are what you think about all day long. Um, what you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. That's one of his more famous ones. The next one says, the purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Next, it says, the only person you are destined to become is the person you decide to be. You have the choice. Next, it says, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. The next one is, live in the sunshine, swim in the sea, drink the wild air. It's not the length of life, but the depth. The next one says, open your eyes to see what can only be felt with the heart and you'll taste the beauty of living slow. When it is dark enough, you can see the stars. Next, fear defeats more people than any other one thing in the world. Next, don't be too timid and squeamish about your actions. All of life is an, experience, an experiment. And the last one says, I don't take life seriously. I take serious moments in life seriously. This is my guru. I love it so much. I love him. I love him. I love him. He is my 18th century baby daddy. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm done. Okay, so the next one. Um, so Ralph Waldo Emerson quotes. This is another one. Um, yeah, these have some more nuanced ones. Basically more so about criticism. So he says, let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am persecuted whenever I am contradicted. The next one says, whatever you do, you need courage. Whatever course you decide upon, there is always someone to tell you that you are wrong. Mm -hmm. Y'all know about that. There are always difficulties arising that tempt you to believe your critics are right. Get those voices out of your head. Get their silly voices out of your head. To map out a course of action and follow it to an end requires some of the same courage that a soldier needs. Peace has its victories, but it takes brave men and women to win them. God, I love this guy. Um... Blame is safer than praise. So some people, they just, it's easier for them to go ahead and blame and be all nasty and vindictive in order to say, in order, uh, than to say, hey, good job. <laughs> you know, some people who come in my comments, I'm like, yeah, you could have just said, hey, good job. But it's okay. It's okay. We know you're salty. It's okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good ones in here. We'd be here all day if we read all of these. So like I said, all of these will be linked in the bio. The next one, uh, how about we go with Barack Obama next? So, Barack Obama's quotes about critics. I accept that people are going to call me awful things every day, and I will always defend their right to do so. I love that. You know, there are some people who go into politics from head, but Barack Obama really is one of those, per those persons who went into politics from heart, and I love that. Um... Contrary to the claims of some of my critics and some of the editorial pages, I am an ardent believer in the free market. And this last quote goes on to say, if critics, if the critics are right that I've made all my decisions based on polls, then I must not be very good at reading them. And I love that because that they really do criticize him of that, which is just ridiculous. You know that it's just microaggressions and... Um, Subtle forms of racism. Okay, so next we have Mark Twain's quotes about critics. The critic's symbol should be the tumblebug. 
He deposits his egg in somebody else's dung. Otherwise, he could not hatch it. Ugh, so true. Just think about that Amber Heard case, you know? All of these people just jumping on the same gross bandwagon. Same thing for Harry and Meghan. So, next one from Mark Twain. The public is the only critic whose judgment is worth anything at all. Well, sometimes, but also sometimes, screw them. One mustn't criticize other people on grounds where he cannot stand perpendicular himself. Let the first without judgment, let he who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Mm -hmm. How often we recall, recall with regret that ne uh, Napoleon once shot at a magazine editor and missed him and killed the publisher, but remember with charity that his intentions were good. His next one says, no man has an appreciation so various that his judgment is good upon all varieties of literary work. Again, guys, pick up a book. From time to time, pick up a book. And if you don't want to pick up a book, just go on Google. Um, it is the will of God that we must have critics and missionaries and congressmen and humorists. And we must bear the burden. Next, he says, tomorrow night, I appear before the first time before a Boston audience. 4,000 critics. That one's funny. Next, he says, the editor is a critic. He has pulled out his carving knife and his tomahawk and is starting after a book which is going to have for breakfast. <laughs> I have stopped smoking now and then for a few months. I like this quote. He says, I have stopped smoking now and then for a few months at a time, but it was not on principle. It was only to show off. I was, uh, it was to pulverize those critics who said I was a slave to my habits and I couldn't break my bonds. Prove those critics wrong. Um, yeah, so that's, let's move on to the next one. So next we have Bob Marley. I loved Bob Marley's quotes. Okay. He was such a visionary. Come on, load on up. Okay, so here we go. Number one, the greatness of a man is not in how much wealth he acquires, but in his integrity and his ability to affect those around him positively. Next, open your eyes. Look within. Are you satisfied with the life you're living? I can't remember what song that's from, but I know that one. <laughs> okay, so we'll skip the next one. After that, he says, when one door is closed, don't you know another is open? Next, he says, I have no education. I have inspiration. If I was educated, I would be a darn fool. <laughs> Next, he says, every man got a right to decide his own destiny. Next, he says, everything is political. I will never be a politician or even think political. Me just deal with life and nature. That is the greatest thing to me. I love the Jamaican accent coming through. Even in the written form, it's awesome. Next, he says, prejudice is a chain. It can hold you. If you prejudice, you can't move. You keep prejudice for years. Never going to get nowhere with that. Now, again, like I said before, you might walk away from an all-out, what it seems like a battle with a microaggressor, feeling like they won, they had the upper hand. I guarantee you, they didn't win a doggone thing. They are just as miserable and angry as they were before they entered into that microaggression, microaggression act with you. So he says, I've been here before and I will come again. Next, he says, God sent me on earth. He sent me to do something and nobody can stop me. If God wants to stop me, then I can stop. Man never can and man never has. If, if Bob Marley was murdered by someone, which I honestly think he could have been. I honestly think he could have been. But if he was, he was not stopped because his music is just as prolific today, if not more, than it was when he was alive. So his next quote says, you have to be someone. Next he says, truth is everybody is going to hurt you. You just got to find the ones worth suffering. This next one's really nice. So he says, me don't dip on nobody's side. Me dip on the black, me don't dip on the black man's side. 
not the white man's side, me dip on God's side, the one who create me and caused me to come from black and white. And there he's talking about his mixed race origins. I love that. Um, he says, if you're white and you're wrong, then you're wrong. If you're black and you're wrong, you're wrong. People are people. Black, blue, pink, green. God make no rules about color. Only society make rules where my people suffer. And that's why we must have redemption and redemption now. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so this was my favorite one and then we'll move on. He said, people want to listen to a message. Word from Jah, Jah meaning God. This could be passed through me or anybody. I am not a leader, messenger. The words of the songs, not the person, is what attracts people. Don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger, guys. It is God who has the final say, not us. God, I have so many quotes. I don't know how I'm going to get through all of these. Okay, so the next one from Martin Luther King. He said, if I sought to answer all the criticisms that crossed my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. Um, maybe just let's just read maybe one, two, maybe three quotes from the rest because uh yeah we gotta have to, we gotta have to wrap this up this one's getting long i know mines are always so long i cannot help it i'm sorry so here's from oprah so she says turn your wounds into wisdom she says be thankful for what you have you'll end up having more if you concentrate on what you don't have you will never have ever ever enough Ooh, I like this one. The next time you look in the mirror, try to let go of the storyline that says you're too fat or too shallow or too ashy or too old. Your eyes are too small or your nose too big. Just look into the mirror and see your face. When the criticism drops away, what you will see then is just you without judgment. And that is your first step towards transforming your experience of the world. Now that really just reminds me of something I told you guys, my brother said to me um, one time when I was in college, you know, I said, hey, how you doing? How you been doing? He said, oh, you know, I, for a while I wasn't doing so great, you know, for a while I was really down about myself, for a while I really was feeling really sorry for myself. And you know what? Then I just kind of looked in that mirror and I was okay. And at the time, I really didn't even know what my brother was talking about. You know, youth. You kind of have to grow and mature and pick those things up. But if you ever feel in some doubt, if you feel in like you got that hate around you, you got those criticisms around you, those microaggressions, that, that abuse, that narcissistic abuse, go look in that mirror. Go look in that mirror. Okay, so next let's take a look at Hillary Clinton. So, like I said, I'm not going to read many from the rest. we got about five or four or five more people to go. So, Hillary Clinton says, I'm sick and tired of people who say that if you debate and disagree with this administration, somehow you're not patriotic. And we should stand up and say, we are Americans and we have the right to debate and disagree with any administration. So, she next one she says, if there is truth or merit in the criticism, try to learn from it. Otherwise, let it roll right off of you. Boom. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, this one's good. Like it or not, women are always subject to criticism if they show too much feeling in public. Yes, 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 and yes. Okay, so next is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and then we got three more people. So, to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, let's see some of her great quotes. Fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Now, um, that's sort of like people primarily on those polarizing videos that I post, those videos about Harry and Meghan, those videos where I say I support um, um, Amber Heard, those videos about Aaron Carter, those videos about Selena Gomez, those polarizing things 
where you basically have people who are just like, you know what, we won't go into it. But though there will be people on those polarizing videos that will come on my channel and say that I'm doing this for views, I'm doing this for clicks, I'm doing this for money. Uh, no, I'm doing this because this is my channel and I like it. I'm doing this because these are the things I'd like to discuss. Now, if you are one, if you wanted to project on me, because I often go on these people's pages, you know, and I don't see that they have a channel. I don't see that they produce any content. So at least I had the courage to go out and talk about what matters to me. Worry about you. If you, and you know what, don't come in here projecting your stuff with me. If you want to talk about the topics that matter to you, go and talk about that on your own platforms. This one's mine. Um, so Ruth goes on to say, next quote, I would like to be remembered as someone who used whatever talent she had to do her work to the very best of her ability. Um, the next one says, when contemplated in this extreme, almost any power looks dangerous. She is getting in right there. Next, she says, I don't say women's rights. I say the constitutional principle of the equal citizenship stature of men and women. You go, girl. Uh, the world kind of like lost a star when it lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Seriously. The next one she says, my mother told me two things constantly. One was to be a lady and the other was to be independent. The study of law was unusual for women of my generation. Most girls, for most girls growing up in the 40s, the most important degree was not your MBA, but your MRS. Women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. I love that. Oh, man. So, this last one was from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Whatever you choose to do, leave tracks. That means don't do it for yourself. You will want to leave the world a little better for, for your having lived. So good. Okay, so next, moving on to Winston Churchill. <clears throat> so, you have enemies? Good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. Right there, that's exactly what I said the other day. If I have negative polarizing comments and my camera died, <laughs> if that's not uh, the universe telling you you're talking too much, I don't know what it is, but I have to finish the rest of these quotes because I'm telling you, you're, you're going to be better for them. So Winston Churchill, you have enemies. Good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. Now, just like I've said before, when I, those polarizing comments come onto my channel, People saying that I'm a big mouth, people saying that I should mind my own business, people saying that I'm a grifter. That right there lets me know that I am doing something right because I've touched a nerve on some of those people who want you to remain complicit. The next thing for Winston Churchill, criticism may not be agreeable, but it is necessary. It fulfills the same function as pain in the human body. It calls attention to an unhealthy state of things. Now, I've been saying the same thing about discussions around critical race theory, around misogyny, around systemic prejudice, systemic racism, around Islamophobia. Nobody wants to just be sitting around talking about these things. Nobody. But it's too important to not talk about. If you had symptoms of a cancer, you would not sit there and just ignore it. You would go and get the proper medical attention. It comes to the same thing. So next, Winston Churchill says, when we judge or criticize another person, it says nothing about that person. It merely says something about our own need to be critical. Next, he says, criticism is easy. Achievement is difficult. I sit there and think about people who criticize Winston Churchill. This war hero, prime minister who has made so many accomplishments in his life. Sir Winston Churchill, actually. Let's call it right by the right title. You know, like, I really think about the people who criticized him. What the heck did they accomplish that, like, gave them the merit to even do that? Same thing for Meghan Markle's critics. It's like, dude, what the heck have you accomplished? Um, 
so yeah 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 this, this that's that's pretty much it on Winston Churchill so moving on so this is from eh, I put Frida Kahlo in here a lot of hers are really um, about her <laughs> her her husband Diego but some of them are really goldens but I'm not gonna read from them I'll just put that one in the list last one we'll talk about is um, I even think I got some more in here. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so the last one is Diana Ross. So Diana Ross says, you can't just sit there and wait for people to give you that golden dream. You've got to get out there and make it happen for yourself. Next, she says, instead of looking at the past, I put myself ahead 20 years and try to look at what I need to do now in order to get there then. Next, she says, take a little time out of your busy day to give encouragement to someone who's lost their way. And then this is the last one I'll do. Um, she says that discipline is a necessary tool to help you get what you want in life. It forces you to stay on center and to move away from things that are not necessary. So let's call it a day there, guys. I'm so glad that you had the time to join me today. I hope that you took something away from this video. Um, I will see you in the next one. I got some more content coming to you about Idris Elba. Um, got some content coming to you. We'll talk more about the microaggression um, from the black black female Southern perspective. We'll talk more about that. Um, I've got some some film and movie reviews coming to you. Uh, Outlander, Outer Banks, Luther. Those are some of the ones that I've been watching lately. Luther, I haven't watched yet, but I'm going to watch that one soon. And uh, what else? We have our live stream on Monday. So lots of really interesting things coming. And by the, by the way, if you have not already, again, uh, if you are not subscribed, go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. Click the bell so you always know whenever, whenever I post a video. And I will see you in the next one. Okay, bye guys.